Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have our lovely guest, Taylor, from his YouTube channel, Flow State, and he is an ESTP. And he's going to give us a deep dive into the ESTP personality today. <laughs> Taylor, would you like to say a few words about your, yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Taylor, if you don't know me. Um, I've got a channel, Flow State, that will either be linked in the description box or I'll comment it. Um, I'm an ESTP, SLE in Socionics, uh, eight wing seven, uh, sexual social. Live in Kansas City, work in construction, have a 10 year old daughter and a girlfriend and a cat. Nice. Uh, <laughs> and his girlfriend is an ISFP. <laughs> cool. So my first question for you, Taylor, is what are three words you would use to describe yourself? I think that I would probably use words that I've heard more. I, mean, I think my response to that question is going to be more um, regurgitated answers than, than uh, just how I view myself. I've realized, especially through typology, that how I think is not how other people think and how I feel like I'm behaving is not how I'm being perceived. And um, even though I feel like I'm chill as could be 98% of the time, uh, I think assertive would be probably the first. That's, that seems to be the one I hear the most. Assertive, determined, and competitive maybe i think that that might have a lot to do with enneagram though maybe more than estp for sure yes so you would be an eight right yes cool yeah i feel like it has some estp too with the competitiveness it's also associated with the thinker dichotomy so it's also an enneagram mix though too <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and there certainly is correlations there. Um, I guess, I'm, you know, when you say ESTP, you're not entirely sure what people get in their head. The the generic MBTI description and like the official MBTI is very much uh, more seven ish than than I am uh, or than a lot are. But it, the SLE in Socionics, which is the SETI users, very much combative. Um, so I, I'd say I'm much more on the SLE combative sort of stern end than, than the other end. For sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, my ESTP brother would probably be more on the combative side too. And I guess like with this series that I'm doing right now, what I'm trying to capture is like, if I put a hundred people who identifies ESTP and like I ask them for their honest experiences, what would they say and what would like collectively be a consensus? What would be like individual variation and what would be like just tends to hold true across ESTPs? This series is not really MBTI. It's, I guess it's not really even socionics, but it's like, what is this vague concept of what an ESTP is? And you can go at it in any way you'd like. And you're coming <laughs> from a personality hacker background? Um, that, I'm one of personality hackers, profiler training, the profiler trainers. Oh, okay. That's cool. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, it's like, I just, I'm on the side of truth. So like whatever holds true with ESTPs, I just want to hear it and I want to absorb it. <laughs> I don't care where it comes from. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's good. I like that. Um, and actually I think that if I, were to swap in another descriptive word, I think that objective is one, that's one that I identify with. It's not one that is as impactful to other people, I suppose. The three describing words I, I listed are all things that are all attributes that are felt by another person pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, but I think that something that is certainly very characteristic of me and that probably is all of all ESTPs is I, I, keep a very clear perspective on things. I don't imagine into things. I don't uh, project emotion onto things. Uh, and 
it is what it is. And I want to understand what it is. I don't ever want that stuff to cloud my, my perception. And I, luckily it's very natural for me to have a clear objective sort of understanding of the surroundings. Yes. So SE is objective by nature. Like it's tuned into the actual thing that's happening, the actual reality around it. And you use this really good word, Taylor, to describe it. You said the word present or presence in, in what's happening. You're not imagining this alternate reality, like extroverted intuition, but like you have this clear sense of in the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, Another word you used to describe yourself, Taylor, before was the word tactical. Um, mm -hmm. You said that ESTPs tend to like notice the tactical implications of things and that sometimes it causes them to be kind of paranoid because they can notice the tactical implications. So I was wondering if you could go into that. <laughs> sure. Um, so SC is objectively aware and TI is, is um, at least from my understanding in the socionics, it is, uh, is systematic. Um, and has has a big sequential component to it. Maybe sequential is the wrong word, but it's uh, it's very logical. So if you're aware of the objective or of the surroundings of your situation, and everything is kind of running through that logical process, you're aware of when you've lost the upper ground. Um, I'm sure that I'm sure that Lo and I and no fi i mean i'm sure everything plays into sort of being crazy aware of how every little action puts you at an ad relative advantage or disadvantage um first and it's just it's just instant it's just automatic and it really it i didn't notice how automatic it was quite as so much as i did once uh, coronavirus panic hit, you know, and I'm seeing a lot of talk and shockingly little of it is about civil, you know, how much authority you're giving up, um, about the tactical components. Of, of course there is some, um, but most of us just kind of keep to ourselves cause it just, you know, if people aren't thinking that way, they're not thinking that way. That is such an interesting point. Uh, it brings a couple of thoughts to mind. So I'm thinking about like how SE, you know, so we talked about how it's in tune with environment, how it's in tune with its environment. And what this causes is that it knows when it's out of control of its environment. And I yeah. know like, Yes, I know like it's typically associated with TE that, you know, to control like and organize your external world. But like something that SE has is an ability to know the opportunities in your environment and to know when you're losing opportunities in your environment and when you're gaining them. So th there's an opportunistic quality to SE that can get confused for some TE like traits just because how it could sound. But it's like SE. It just knows when you can utilize and leverage the present moment in certain ways. That's but it's, it, yeah, it's more moment to moment than TE would be. TE is more of this like systematized approach. Um, but SE is like you notice right at that moment when you can utilize any node around you. So it's more of this now awareness than TE would be. And that's like the difference between them. I agree. <laughs> I agree. TE. Um... And from my perspective, it feels like TE commits too, uh, uh, too quickly to things, you know? Um, and I feel, and I'm, I assume that this is an SE consistent thing, but I feel like um, I'm not hubristic enough almost to think that I'm in control of my life more than, or my surroundings more than the world is. And so I've got a way better chance of acting correctly if I'm able to ride the world I'm in instead of try to plow through uh, a force that's really not in my control. It's, it's more about riding. It's more about surfing than, than building. 
Yeah, surfing has this adaptive quality to it because the wave, you go with the wave, like you work yeah. with what you have. Um, yeah. And I think a SE phrase is like carpe diem, seize the moment or seize the day. Mm -hmm. Like SE users are good at like just seizing what the day has to offer. <laughs> and yeah, it was, it, I was gonna say anything, anything else feels, um, it, is, it feels like a waste or like you're you're doing something wrong. Like if you don't have, if I don't have the ability to capitalize on something, on an opportunity, um, then I put myself in a bad situation. It is irresponsible of me to get so committed to something that I wasn't able, that I missed an opportunity and nothing throughout my life has, has I don't have regrets really. Uh, I don't have them for any mistakes I have made, it, but I do regret opportunities I've missed, so. Yeah. Like it's an SE thing to capitalize on opportunity because there there's a type of sensory acuity you need to then capitalize because you need to know when the sensory is updating itself. When it is like continuously changing, you, you need to know how to move with the current to capitalize on all the opportunities. That's what SE does the best out, out of, I would say even out of all cognitive functions. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, cool. And so what are three words you would describe ESTPs as flow state? Realistic, direct, playful, but in sort of a, a pokey sort of way, you know, it's, there is a certain brand of playfulness, but I do think that we are playful and, and people don't even realize it a lot. Which is yeah. fine, which is fine. It, it's kind of part of the game. <laughs> yeah, ESTPs are playful. They kind of like uh, sometimes mess in with their environment, like, or like, <laughs> yes. My my brother's form of playfulness is that um when he sees an open road, he'll like speed a little on his car or like if there's like a circle track, like he'll, he'll purposely go on the circle route a few more times because it's fun to like drift and like rotate his car. <laughs> so it's For that sure. silliness or like that playfulness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, speed is fun. Yeah. So in what ways in your life do you speed? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't really anymore much like i don't i don't race or, or do anything crazy um i have owned one motorcycle was a crotch rocket um i didn't have it for very long my mom and my girlfriend were mad as hell that i bought it um <laughs> when i was younger me and my friends used to go uh do street races we'd you know there were places in town where people would, with cars that wanted to, to street race would just sort of find each other and meet up. Um, it, it wasn't people you knew. It was just car people. I, I don't know. Just because it was before cell phones, it was just sort of an automatic thing. You just drove around until you find the spot with the people and then start having, having street races. And I was friends with some, uh, I had some friends who had some nice cars and I never had nice cars. Um, but they did. So when I hung out with them, we, we did some street racing when I was younger and I did a little bit of that, but, um, anymore, I'm, I'm a grown ass man with a daughter and, you know, I just, I'm an adult now. That's too much of a, there's too much repercussion if you happen to get pulled over, especially since I have a record. So, you know, it's a cop's not going to give me the benefit of the doubt. Now I do almost always speed you know, reasonably, um, five, 10, sometimes 15 over, like I move faster than the flow of traffic. That is, that is great. Very <laughs> um, <laughs> fun to be in the car with you or, or terrifying depending Actually, on Actually, most people right. hate it. <laughs> um, I scare, I, I, if you're not used to it, people get real scared and I forget that I drive. I've never caused a wreck. I'm a fantastic driver, but I don't slow down a lot when I take corners and I accelerate fast and I brake fast and I text and, you know, 
light cigarettes and change the music and and if you're not used to me i can certainly see how that it would look like i'm just completely out of control and not paying attention and we're all gonna die so there are people that refuse to ride with me <laughs> it feels like imminent death i used to tell my brother when i was in a car with him that it felt like a roller coaster ride in a car ride because <laughs> it was like so fast sometimes um, yeah for the thrill of it. Sometimes there's a rush that comes from <laughs> testing your sensory. I oh, love yeah, how sure. you light your cigarettes with a blowtorch. <laughs> oh my. Yeah, it's fun for sure. And I would love I would love it if I could do it more, but it's just too easy to get caught. You're too wide out in the open in public and there's too many cops everywhere. Uh, you know, right now would be the time to do it actually because cops across the country aren't, <laughs> aren't trying to do a lot of stuff but but i don't have the cars for it really uh-huh not like not like my suzuki or anything yeah interesting so i guess in what ways do you risk take like legally um, or legally <laughs> up to you what you want to share so at 33 right now i'm actually in where i'm at right now is i'm trying to teach myself to not risk take as much. Um, I'm working on going the other way. I risk take in basically any way you, you present me with. I look at everything as a risk reward analysis. Um, and, and I'm sure that that's both a product of, of TI um, and of the fact that I've worked in a bank for years and I've got an economics and I just understand that tool well. Um, but if you look at most situations, try not to incriminate myself too much. I've always taken a lot of risks. Most of them have been illegal. Um, I've had really very few qualms breaking the law. Um, but I always tried to do it smartly. I never did ridiculous stuff. I never did douchey stuff. I was never out, you know, spray painting things or, or any of that stuff, but I have taken risks where there was rewards and when I could kind of manage the dangers around me, if that's ambiguous enough, <laughs> um, then when I was when I was thirty, I got uh, I got caught finally. Finally, the risk caught up with me, and now I'm just happy that I'm just happy to not be in prison. So I was looking at fifteen years, and I got probation and got out and got um, stuff together. And being a father really has helped me curb that a lot because um, I've had custody of my daughter since she was two. And I just can't throw her back in that situation. So I don't take risks anymore. I almost never take risks that I can't afford to lose with no real bumps. Um, I, I sort of satisfy myself with doing other things like stocks, you know, I've got Stop. enough money. Yeah. Yeah. I've got that enough is, money in the stock market. That, yeah. Yeah. That is such an ESTP thing. <laughs> my, my brother is an investor in stock. He likes mm. investing in stocks. ESTPs, because of SE, it's noticing. SE is responsible for noticing trends around you, too. So, like, you know when a certain stock might go up or, like, a certain thing is rising because you're so attuned of your sensory environment that you can tell when things are changing. And so you're good with, like, stocks and stuff. And there's a certain, like, you mentioned risk-taking. And, like... I think there's a certain proclivity towards wanting to risk for that reward that ESTPs are okay with making. Like, like they, there's a saying, risk it for the biscuit. And like mm -hmm. ESTPs are good at risking it for the biscuit because they know like, yeah, yeah some risks. I mean, <laughs> I, I think that, I think that to have, you're never going to have a big payoff if you don't take any risks. And I do believe to an extent in the value of, slow consistent diligently building stuff but that's not going to take you over the hump right that'll keep you that'll keep you from from hitting 
bottom, but it's not going to get you to the top. So I very much believe in taking in taking risks. Otherwise, you've lost your opportunity. You've just missed your opportunities. Then, if you don't take risks, um, and I forgot what the other part of it was, but I will say that I don't think we like. I don't enjoy games that are weighed, weighted against me. I'm not a gambler. I went to I went to Vegas. I didn't gamble not one bit. I did plenty of risky things, but I didn't play one game. I understand the odds. Or I understand the math and the odds well enough to know that I'm not going to do shit. Uh, and I don't like being in the sucker position. It's more fun if you can game a system and figure out how to put yourself in the upper with the upper hand. Yeah. My ESTP brother is amazing at gaming systems. Like he's good at knowing like when a certain refund is happening, like, or a certain contest is happening where he can put his cards in and he'll win. And so the thing is like SETI ESTPs are good at opportunity analysis. So, you know, flow state talked about risk analysis, like I, I guess that maybe a word for it um, uh, to coin it is like an opportunity analysis. It's like, if the cards are in my favor, why wouldn't I play? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's that. What are the odds that I'm going to win? And then if I win, how good is the reward? If I lose, how bad is the loss? And um, something that, that I ended up kind of talking to and mentoring and coaching a lot of younger men about is, is girls the, because Guys are nervous about getting shut down from girls. And I try to, that's what I try to explain to them right off the bat is think about the risk and the reward. What are you, what should, what could your reward be? Well, all sorts of things, you know, um, you could marry that chick or you could get laid. Um, what's your risk? You'll get told no by a chick that you saw at Starbucks and will never see again. And it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> That, that is so true. Yeah. Um, so it's like with the TI, it can calculate like how much risk to how much reward. And I know like people always associate with TE and I'm like, it's not that like there's so many SE TI characteristics that are associated with TE that like I'm just trying to clear up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but, and I have been mistaken for ESTPs or I'm sorry for uh, ENTJ. Not a lot, uh, but that is one yeah you're such a clear-cut estp i can't believe they said that <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's it's not com it's not common um <laughs> but i do feel like i'm like the caricature of my types both ways uh eight wing seven <laughs> and an estp um yeah i think you are probably like the best representation representation of your type that i could find on the internet so <laughs> yeah super glad to serve <laughs> yes. So my next question for you is, what are some core features of ESTBs that you notice? You mentioned paranoid, like you notice this trend of ESTBs being paranoid. And I was wondering if you could go into that. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it turns out that ESTPs, we all seem to have strong leanings towards being libertarian minded and conspiracy theorists. Um, and it's, it comes back to that tactical awareness um, and a demand for, for freedom and autonomy. We don't need stuff. We don't expect stuff. Don't expect stuff of us. Leave us alone. Let us, let us do our thing. Um, and, I mean, conspiracy theories, when you boil it down, it's, it's, it's sort of just an awareness of the risk that somebody will try to infringe on you, which is very real <laughs> you know um you can throughout history you can look at i mean people are always trying to dominate other people it's just human nature and i think that we're particularly aware of it uh i don't i don't know that paranoid is the right real word because it's not an emotional fear it's it's an honest assessment of like, this is going on over here and it may not, it may not manifest, but you know what? I'm gonna give myself a little head start on it if it does. 
and it's just kind of keeping your eye on that and and just watching how things evolve and right now there's a lot of things in the world there's a lot of things to keep tab on in the world so it's like east tps are so aware of the risks of things that it can make them kind of like hyper vigilant for when something could maybe like turn against their hand because they're so hyper aware of when that happens that now they're just on the lookout like um something to describe se doms is response ready like like yes. SD DOMs are always ready to respond in the moment. So yeah. it, it can cause like a paranoia because they're they're ready for whenever something could happen that's negative <laughs> to like it's, respond. Yeah, and it is very proactive. We want to be interactive and address the situations around us. Um and when when coronavirus first kind of hit and became a a, a fear. We didn't know anything about it before any lockdowns went into place or whatever, or shortly before there was about three or four days there where I was real worried about it. Um, but I didn't have any information about it and there's nothing really do about it. And that I think was the first sort of situation where it's was like, fuck, we might have a problem coming and there's not anything to do. Um, and, and not being able to sort of arrange things, you know, for, for whatever's coming is not a comfortable feeling, but, but yeah, most of the time our, our prepper tendencies or conspiracy theory, um, thinking or, or whatever is, uh, not paranoid is preparative. That is such a good way of putting it. Yeah. My my ESTP brother, I keep relating it back to him, but it's just to draw real life examples for anyone who needs it. So um, he'll text me cause I'm in HR and he'll like, so in HR, would this be okay? Like you need to know, like, so he'll put a situation he's going through and see if it's um, okay. And it shows kind of like the preparatory quality of ESTPs. Cause mm -hmm. like they know that they have to be tactical with how they deal with things. So they'll want to, it can seem like paranoia, but it's really prep, preparation um but not, not in the judger sense it's almost like um you're preparing for the immediate steps ahead um but it's like Heidi Puri says like perceivers are like hopping from lily pad to lily pad but it's like East TV is doing it in a very like preparatory like down to earth way where they're able to know like exactly what they need to prep for um yeah yeah if if something feels inevitable or whatever um, or if we're going to initiate a situation that's combative or that where there's conflict or however we're mental. I mean, I almost never take up a conflict situation if I don't have it played out to the end in, in my head, you know, I I'm ready for this. And then, you know, okay. So if this happens, if A or B happens, how will I deal with this? How will I deal with that? And then you just walk down sort of every scenario. And yeah, if I, if I, if I enter into a conflict with somebody, I'm sure your brother is the same way. Um, I, I, I don't, I've won basically. That's why I'm doing it. It's almost never impulsive or reactive. Yeah. East TPs are so calculating in that way there's like a calculating quality to them because they know exactly like how to measure the risk and the reward. And like, it's, they're way less um, impulsive than people give them credit for, but they are like, um, it can seem impulsive because the, they, they take larger leaps than a normal person would. And just the normal person, they wouldn't be able to view that opportunity. So they just see it as pure impulsiveness. But if you were the ESTP and you saw the opportunity present to you, it, you'd be kind of like a madman to not take it if you were that aware of that opportunity. So it's just. We do take some risks that are <laughs> stupid and we know it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the we are still SE leads, but yeah, I, I do agree that we are a lot less impulsive than, than the stereotype, but it looks impulsive and that's not necessarily an accident. Um, we like having cards up our sleeve. Yeah, definitely. 
I wonder if that goes back to like the trust thing, like having cards up your sleeve means like it's also kind of paranoia too. <laughs> um, I actually, I think it, I suspect it's got a lot to do with FI polar. Oh, can you tell me more? Yeah. I think that to somebody else, what might seem pessimistic or, or kind of mean or callous or whatever. The reality is that you can't trust people. And I mean, you've never been betrayed by somebody you didn't trust, right? Um, and if you look out just at families, marriages, business relationships, friendships, things have a way of turning. Um, most of them don't last forever. And we don't trust the value of, we don't, we don't trust the strength of person to person, just the FI bond, like a lot of other people do. Um, I think we've, we've, we don't not value, we don't, we just don't trust it. And, it, and it just, yeah. That is absolutely so fascinating. Probably rings true with a lot of ESTPs. It sounds like my brother, all right. <laughs> Um, and so my next question for you is, are there any ESTP celebrities, you know, or any examples of the type in fiction? Before I answer that, let me jump back to the impulsive for part. Sure. I think that um, when we are impulsive, it's driven by, uh, we crave more just in general of whatever extremes, excesses, um, more intense experiences. And that's what I think will kick off ESTP impulsiveness. It's not impulsive or unplanned behavior. It's draw it's desire for that feeling or experience or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, it's a desire for like the feeling of exhilar exhilar exhilaration or like yeah. a lightness that you're chasing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, Enneagram refers to it as lust, the desire for excess. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not lust for, for sex only, although that is certainly included. It's lust for just everything, just more excess of intensity. Yeah. The gathering of intensity or gathering of life and experience. Uh, yeah, it's very cool. And, and so my next question for you is, <laughs> Uh, celebrity examples and any type examples. I don't pay attention to celebrities a lot. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that Jack Nicholson is one. Cool. I think that Bill Burr is one. Um, oh, I think Donald Trump is one. I think Tech Nine is one. I think that Michael Jordan might be one. I'm sure a lot of athletes are. I guess I don't. I don't know what most athletes' personalities are like. I'm not. I don't watch interviews of, and stuff like that. But uh, I do think Michael Jordan is one. Maybe Vince Vaughn. Oh, Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's an ESTP for sure. Blair White, and she might be one. Uh, Angelina Jolie is that's one mm -hmm. thank you for providing such good examples uh that really got me thinking <laughs> like it's, sure. it's yeah awesome and so my next question for you is how would you describe your cognitive function stack how do you experience se extroverted sensing automatically i don't you know um fuck i mean it it's one of those things I've had to work to, to see, you know, in myself, um, which I assume is the same for everyone's dominant function. But I, as I think that now that I am aware of it, I, I'd, I'd experience it as, like I said earlier, um, objective, calm, calm. To it, which is probably surprising for people, but um, since there's not, it's not in E, there's, it's not imagining, 
just present. There's there's a there is a sort of zen to it to just be there and not be cooking up scenarios or whatever in your head and also to trust in your ability to be there the you know the longer i live the more i realize that um i improvise very very well better than anyone else so in any given situation you know that that gives you a bit of confidence knowing that anything could happen and you, it, however you respond will probably be well better than average. Um, so I do think that there's a sort of calmness or confidence there and um, determination, but a specific kind of determination that's competitive or combative. Um, it's not TE determination. Like I'm going to wake up every morning early and, and, you know, conquer this goal we can be absolutely goddamn lazy um if something if we don't have anything exciting to do but um if some if somebody challenges me or tells me not to do something it's fucking on <laughs> you know that's where the determination kicks in do you care if i cuss sorry oh I you should... can totally just uh yeah okay for your, okay for your... <laughs> there's a weird still like popping though it's like um yeah i don't like those things anyways for sure, for sure. um you can hear that that noise still can't you i think that that what you were hearing earlier is the water and i need to tell people to stop fucking running the water for sure All right, um, the uh, super or the uh, the celebrity thing. That question is hard from an NE perspective. It's um, it's hard. It's just hard to think of things like that on the spot. Like, oh well, who are some celebrities? But uh, when I went inside, I saw some things on the wall, and I think that Corey Taylor from Slip, the lead singer of Slipknot is. There's that. That is so awesome. <laughs> yeah, great examples. So my next question for you, Flow State, is what is your experience with TI? How do you experience it? It's how you make decisions. I mean, not to exactly quote the, the, the description of a judging function, but it's how you figure things out, how you make decisions. Um, it's not just, it's not, the core of my worldview, like SE is, um, but so, so I mean, it's something that I actively engage. When I'm doing TI, I know it, um, and it's intentional, but it's supernatural as the way that I evaluate basically everything, and I mean, it's, I just, I just. I can't, I literally still can't comprehend why anybody would make decisions not based on what makes the most sense. Um, so yeah, I just can't imagine not making decisions based on sort of what, what I consider con logical consistency. Yeah. Perhaps because people can't see that or they like, they don't, they're not as, good at making logic congruent as you guys are <laughs> i think that's partially true but i also i think i mean yes probably but also i think that that um the involvement of, of fi particularly conflicts with you know the value of ti obviously yeah um people might see how one thing would be more logical or makes more sense but still feel it's wrong that's true. Yeah. So people's FI get in the way of them using TI. <laughs> Which actually does make sense sometimes. Like, for instance, for me, I feel like my responsibility to my daughter is more important than my responsibility to any other human being by fucking such a magnitude that I, I'm going to buy my daughter a piece of candy that she doesn't need before I'm going to buy a homeless man a cheeseburger that he might need. 
and absolutely unapologetically because this is my person but that's also my daughter that should be my person i'm not responsible for the seven billion people on the planet who needs stuff <laughs> that's you know so great points on on ti and so like s-e-t-i another word to describe it is like resourceful like estps are exceptionally resourceful um and knowing like you were talking to me about how you'll listen to things by putting your phone in your hard hat during work. And I feel like that's a good example of ESTP resourcefulness. It's just in the moment, figuring out things as you go and picking a great option like that. And, and so, yeah, uh, any, uh, like, <laughs> and I guess that brings us to the next cognitive function in the ESTP stack, which well, is uh, FE. Actually about that hard hat okay. thing though, I think it's also, um, it, I think the uh, observation, the nature of SE that takes in information is always observing um, the environment and just just consuming information, really. I think that we consume information in a way that people don't understand. Um, I think the hard hat phone thing plays a lot to that. I love the fact that I can spend all day long um, to an extent but I can listen to a lot of shit. I get a lot of information in that way. And I, that's really kind of a, uh, an appealing component of my job is that I am able to consume information while working. Yeah. It's like you can take in a breath of stuff and that's really amazing. So good on you, Taylor. <laughs> you find that third solution, that life hack. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. We love life hacks. <laughs> yes, ESTPs and their life hacks. <laughs> game a system. Anytime we can game game a system, we're we're happy people. Yeah, expert at gaming the system. <laughs> ESTP life, <laughs> and so that brings us to your third cognitive function, FE. Can you tell me a bit about your experience with FE? Sure. Um, it's like frosting. It's the best part of the cake, but you don't want to just eat it alone, All right? So um, I enjoy I enjoy Effie um, when it's good, Effie. But it's not. I don't ever want to make decisions out of it. If I if I if I try to make a decision focusing on Fe instead of Ti, it feels like I just sold my soul, <laughs> um, and it can't do a lot of heavy lifting. I'm trying to trying to get something, trying to achieve some end through FE. Also feels kind of whorish, but it's just just not that good, you know. I, I'm just not convincing enough for people to to not see through the shit, you know. That's fascinating. So do you ever use FE in to support your TI, like wanting to game the system? Yes. Yeah. Um, once I've figured out the system and how to, once I'm confident in my understanding of the system, then the FE comes a lot smoother because it's not doing the work. It's supplementing the understanding. For instance, so when I was, when I worked at a bank, I wore a suit every day. And across the street was uh, the hospital. And anytime I went to the hospital, for, if I had an appointment or if I was going over to pay a bill or whatever, or anytime I was over there, when I was wearing a suit, after I was done with whatever I was doing, I'd just start walking around the building and back in the off limits areas and you know all that stuff. Because I figured out that if you're walking around in a suit, people just assume that you belong there. You know, nobody questions you. So it's just kind of a fun game to do whatever the fuck I wanted afterwards because I understand the system. And then the FE then came, then, then the FE became the icing. It was fun. I didn't have to do any work with it. Um, so then I actually ended up using it more and talking to doctors and nurses and, you know, just, <laughs> just all that shit. So that's great. <laughs> you mentioned in one of your videos before that I watched, uh, that ESTPs and ESFPs are good at getting other people to do what they want. So I wonder if 
like it, it, SE has to do it too because ESFPs can do it too. But I think it's also some of the FE for the ESTP being able to like get people to do what they want, maybe. So this might be where socionics branches a little bit because uh, I'm a socionics person primarily, and uh, in in that system, your sixth slot is your second strongest function. You just don't value it. So, so ESFPs have better F SE. They just don't value it. And in my experience, um, that is the case. I mean, my ex-wife was, uh, when I met her, she worked, she had just moved back to Kansas City, but she had worked as a uh, poolside waitress at the Hard Rock uh, in Tampa. And that whole job is being friendly to rich people, you know? Um, I, on the other hand, waited tables for a semester in college, and I absolutely hate it. I'll move into a refrigerator box in the alley before I'll ever wait another table. I just don't like it. So I think we use it in different ways. I think that um, if you watch ESFPs try to achieve things, they try to gather allies as a core part of their plan and there's fe involved in that for sure and i think that they've that they they lean on that tool harder um i think that we understand how to use fe but in a tio i don't know how to explain this we're going to use ti we're both going to use force but an ESTP is going to use force and understanding of the system and then an understanding of how that impacts the other person from an FE perspective. But I don't ever try to control other people through the FE primarily. Like I said, it doesn't do a lot of heavy lifting. So I guess I sort of rambled off without a place to land it. And I don't know if that's specifically what you're asking, but no, I think... I think that ESFPs use FE more to get shit done, um, but are maybe a little less. There's a certain insightfulness I think ESTPs have with how um, how another person is going to feel in response to witnessing our action towards them. That that was so well run down. <laughs> Thank you. Are you, uh, are you just are you just buttering me up? No, no, no I liked it. it. It all solid gold. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us to your last cognitive function, NI. Could you tell us a bit about your experience with NI? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um. It's uh, its absence has caused some serious issues throughout life but um but you know you learn shit when you're young and and that's the best time to fuck up um and as i've gotten older i actually think that and have been told that i'm pretty good i've got good ni for where it's at relatively and i think that it's just i think it's mostly because i've fucked up at it enough that I've sort of learned through trial and error more than most people. Um, NI is, is uh, it's woo woo. It's woo woo. It's magic. It's all that sort of, sort of sparkly, shiny, elusive stuff. So I like it a lot, but I, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with it. <laughs> I, I love how you said trial and error. Yeah, so SPs, like flow state, when they use NI, it, they get there through a process of trial and error. Whereas someone with high stack NI, like, you know, like an INFJ like me, is more likely to not use trial and error. Even like, I'm an introvert too, so that even adds to it. But like, NI for INFJs, like they'll try to like forecast it so they don't even have to go through that experience. Cause, um, so, it, it's different than an SP who would want to maybe trial and error. Cause like with, with sensors, it's kind of like you need to validate with reality that it's a thing and the trial and error lets you know that it is actually a thing in concrete reality. 
So then yeah. you can store it in your NI. But NI users might skip that concrete reality step and just like go to their NI insight, if that makes any sense. Which, yeah, it does. It does. But the, where, where it starts to evade me is how do you know if you have any insight at all? How do you know that you're not just sitting there imagining shit that has, you know, had, how do you trust that your insight is insight? <laughs> There's a big com component that intuition is imagining and like this analysis without like the doing and experience. And I guess I, the, how I trust it is like, I see it as a theme in other people. So through analyzing things from a safe, distance it gets me knowledge <laughs> there's i think that there's uh in so in socionics ni is is you can reduce it to, to the time variable it's time and um i i know that i have a very short-term perspective on things and all the sc doms i've talked to do as well so it's um we can see the patterns as they're coming around us that's why we're not caught off guard by things it's but it's on a very short term scale we can't see how today's actions are going to impact us in a month oh that is um very different from me i see everything long term like so everything to me is like a russian doll it, it's like you see the surface but everything is an indication of a long-term thing and you just have to keep searching inside that russian doll like you open it and there's another layer there's another layer and there's another layer and each one is a long-term implication it, it almost feels like when you have an eye you're so so vastly aware of the long-term implications of, of things and the sustainability of things and the outcome and ramification or like just the patterns, but over the span of this long horizon and it kind of, you feel it, you know it. And for me, it's, and for me, life is more like a, you ever read like a choose your own ending book when you're yeah. a kid? That's what it's <laughs> like. You've got, you've got these, you know, three pages in front of you and then what? Wow. That is so cool. I, I love that way of putting it. <laughs> Choose your own ending. Yeah, because you, you're you making that choice every page. Well, yeah, I mean, we don't know what's... I don't know what's going to happen in the next three pages. How the fuck am I supposed to plan three chapters ahead? Uh, it's It feels... It feels um, hubristic, almost, to think that I can can guess, can have any idea what's going to happen. Uh, I've used this example a lot of times. If you know the interview question, where do you see yourself in five years? Hate that fucking question. At no point in my life would my answer have been correct. I never would have guessed right. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that might even be the case for like most people. Anyone who says that honestly might actually be lying. And so I feel like ESTPs are good at calling out BS. Like you throughout this interview, you like you've told me so many things that are potentially BS. Like we were talking about before this, like ADHD and about how you think that it is like not a real thing. And so something that ESTPs do is like they go like, you know what, this this is bullshit. Like this isn't like so they call out things as they are. Like it. Mm. And yeah. It was, oh yeah. It, it, yeah. So it, you should. That's. The ESTP Facebook group, um, I kind of enjoy watching different types of Facebook groups and seeing how they interact. ESTPs were pretty inactive. We're not posting a lot of shit to Facebook. But when somebody comes in, uh, I swear to God, the about 50% of the posts are INFJs coming in and going, Hi, ESTPs, I'm an INFJ. What do you think about INFJs? And every one of them gets like this <laughs> like rapid fire list of one line responses that's <laughs> um kind of is kind of picking on them but not like maliciously <laughs> it's like you know but that is hilarious <laughs> cool. but yeah we all have that sort of that sort of uh blunt uh, you know, low key abrasive, just edge or nature. It, yes. it's, it's funny seeing a whole cluster of people who also do that. Cause I'm, you know, you live life kind of being 
that guy. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then to see a whole shitload of us, it's like, oh. Uh, man, that that is a lot of gold. <laughs> I, now I'm I'm an INFJ who should not ask in the ESTP group what they think of me because <laughs> I know don't how they. That. Yeah, don't yeah. ask it that way. We get that a lot. You'll get, you'll get. Uh, <laughs> I'll get a snarky get, response. You'll get a snarky <laughs> response, but you might like the snark. You know, like, I might do it for the snark. By, you know, we get dazzled by each other's dominant functions. <laughs> We really do. So that brings us to our next question. What What is a misunderstanding that people have of ESTPs? What do they get wrong about the type? Uh, I mean, well, the easiest, and, and it's not particularly insightful, but straight from the hip, I'd say, there's the uh, the sensor, sensor bias, if you want to call it. Um, and I think that until people get more familiar with what the uh, the sensing and intuition functions actually are, and then have a chance to interact with different types and really get an understanding. I think that people are shocked at how logical we are. They, ex they expect, you know, the jock frat boy, we should have a beer bong and two DUIs and, and, play football and scholarship, you know, and live in a frat house. Uh, and some of that is true. We've certainly got a frat boy side to us, but um, at the end of the day, we're, we're more thought out and logical um, than also than we display really. Incredibly. You, you're a very intelligent person, flow state. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> And so my last question is, what advice would you give to East TVs watching this? Or even to yourself? Um, my, my younger self, I would suggest a few things. First of all, practice long-term goals. Um, we, when you try to surf each wave through life and just catch the series of of best opportunities aren't always pointed in the same direction and so you can take you can get every opportunity that pops up but if you're not aiming it at all in a direction it doesn't have a cumulative effect so i'd, I'd suggest that i would also suggest um trying to show a bit more respect for um, social, for the value of social pleasantries or whatever than we're inclined to. Like when you walk in on Monday morning to work and people are like, oh, hi, good morning, how was your weekend? And you don't give a fuck because it's Monday morning and you assume that this person doesn't give a fuck either. Right? So, so your response might be sort of dismissive we won't, I think that we undervalue those sort of social exchanges. And I think that attending to them, even forcing ourselves, if we think it's stupid, at some point we'll start to see that they do serve a purpose. Um, not everyone's like us. And it, it just, it's, it's respectful or something. Like one thing that I do is I try to, I try, well, I've, seriously lapsed on it but for a long time i was trying to say happy birthday to people on facebook on their birthday because people like it it's a piece of cake and people like it and it's just that's the sort of thing that i think that we absolutely dismiss but would be well served to not that is fantastic advice close state and to just demonstrate like how smart you know taylor is could you tell me like your thoughts on adhd and like your ideas on it and like what oh, your opinion yeah. on it is. Yeah. I think that it's, I think that people aren't meant to um, sit in schools or offices and it, they're meant to sit and be bored for their whole lives. Um, that's not how we developed. And I think the ADHD is not real. I think that it's, it's, we're medicating 
the way that we're not adapted to the environment we've created for ourselves. We're trying to force ourselves into a lifestyle that doesn't fit our biology. Um, and so you give kids meth pills. Well, <laughs> that's that's not a healthy solution. I don't think there's not. A, I just don't believe that there's a disorder that's this prevalent that requires meth. You know, it's just the problem is that life is boring. Is that we're putting kids in in basically little little prisons for the whole fucking day, bored, making them bored out of their mind and teaching them to comply when they should be out learning. It should be exploratory, um, not boring. Kids, I mean, kids are programmed to learn. It's instinctual. And I think it's really a shame that, that, that our education system is so crushing of that and and i think that's what adhd is mostly I've, I've really been uh i've been pretty happy with school being out since the coronavirus is down because i think that i think the social aspect interact learning how to interact with peers and getting that social environment is really the only value most kids get out of school learning how to read learning how to do math and socializing Besides that, I think it's a waste of time. I think that kids are, I think that it's, uh, I don't want to say abusive, but certainly oppressive. Um, and and I've been happy that she's been able to, to miss that. Yeah. It also, it also forces people into compliance, into compliant mindsets in a way that's more, that's too far. Yeah. Yeah. And that was incredibly deep because um, you addressed this topic where people medicate when they do things against their biology. So when you are actually like not living in like your truth or whatever you call it, like you literally will medicate in some way and it's not natural. And it just means that you're in a subpar situation. And like, it's, it's a really like, deep topic that you mentioned the compliance mindset or like having a compliant mindset is unhealthy and that's like incredible incredibly insightful like people don't realize how smart estvs are and that is an example like how like taylor just mentioned a compliant mindset you know how many areas that can also trickle down in someone's life like everywhere. like subtle everywhere yeah subtly doing things that are compliant but like they kill your soul like they like they chip away at it and it's useless like why are you doing that it's why and, we're it's why we're here right now where we are right now in this country and i don't mean to say anything that's going to be i don't mean to have a political thing i'm not trying to throw my political beliefs at people but if it weren't for such a compliant malleable population I don't think that we'd have the uh, the racial conflicts that we're having right now. Um, I don't because I mean a lot a lot of that is there's a lot of political correctness ideology at play in the whole movement, and that is a compliance mindset. I don't care what you say. There are vast sections of PC beliefs that are illogical to the core and people just comply with it. And now people don't seem to know where the boundary is. Well, the boundary is reality. If you're lying, if you're regurgitating a lie because you're complying, we got a problem. You're setting yourself up for errors in the future. And I think that's one thing I think that um, people not understanding how to analyze and, and look at the coronavirus situation objectively because we gotta follow orders. I can't tell you how many fucking people on Facebook or Twitter or wherever, say this fucking thing to me or to, to other people. Well, I trust the experts. It's like that snarky, I believe in the experts. I don't, I'm not stupid enough to think I'm smarter than a doctor. Okay, that's correct. But um, it's also a logical fallacy. It's a default to authority. That's not the, that's not the ult. You still have to assess things for yourself. You have to look and say, this person's a doctor. Do I trust this person? You got to also take into account, is this person behaving truthfully? Is this person, you know, 
acting deceptively you know what's what's the whole picture and how do we analyze all this together um but there's there's such an arrogant uh tendency to default to authority and to then brag about it that it's obvious these people don't understand that this is not <laughs> it's literally you're committing a logical fallacy this is not the best way to assess things just to default to i mean scientists and doctors are treated as priests now our society has a religious association with science and when people are compliant it causes them to be in worse situations than they could be in and it's like a huge pandemic like there's the pandemic of covid but there's also like the pandemic of people just being compliant to their situations compliant to authority compliant to the easiest solution which is not like or the path of least resistance for them which is sometimes leads them down bad paths um for the yeah. country as a whole and sometimes as people in individually too and i mean i'll, I'll admit that while i think people are too, com too compliant and it, that there's an ideological component to it that's irrational it's very very probable that i've got an ideologic ideological affiliation with autonomy so yeah i mean I, i'm aware that that's there <laughs> but still like the math seems yeah, to add yeah. in my favor even with the bias uh, yeah like perceivers just generally like have a bias towards uh, wanting autonomy and plus you being an ep you want like freedom you're fixated on freedom and like even an op like you're fixated on like chaos like chaos monkeys so <laughs> it makes sense that Did you're you on the side chaos of monkeys <laughs> yes. Is that, that is that an OP phrase or is that a U phrase? That's an OP phrase. <laughs> I like, I've never heard that. I like it. Yeah. So that makes sense that you don't like compliant mindsets because chaos monkey. See, so ESTPs can talk very extensively about very like pressing issues. Yeah. So you, you, you've seen it firsthand. <laughs> and so thank you, Flow State. Um, thank you, Taylor, for thank just... You. <laughs> for being such an amazing guest. You clearly show that ESTPs are very intelligent or like you're an example that they have a very like in-depth side and that they can analyze issues in a very complex, intricate and very like, it, it's actually like very brilliantly analyzed. <laughs> and thank so you. thank you, thank you for just showing us the, the depth of insight that an ESTP can have. and. Like, thank you for represent, rep, rep, representing your type so well. You really, like, are a great example of, like, a good ESTP guy. So <laughs> thank you for just being that and just enriching the type community by being having your presence in the type community. Well, thank you for thanking me for all those things. That was great. <laughs> See, <laughs> that, that's where FE is good. It's like, yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You show me to live on the wild side by lighting your cigarettes with the blowtorch. Uh, you know, oh, that's that's not the wild side. It's way wilder than that. You'll love it. <laughs> there are several notches higher than that. One day you'll take all the IJs blindfolded skydiving off a plane. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know what, though? I've never been skydiving. Um, the one time we were supposed to go, it, rain it ended up storming that day. So we uh, we're gonna we just never ended up rescheduling it, and it's been bugging the hell out of me since. So when uh, hell, I don't know if they're they might be open now. That is something that's been on my you know doing the near future list is is jump out of the plane. That's so great. Time, I know that the first time you dive, you have to do it with a partner. Um, <laughs> why people get scared when they hang out with you Plasty. <laughs> yeah well and we and we like kind of bringing other people to their boundary yeah we and we have fun doing that too other <laughs> you guys people's like boundaries are always further behind ours and uh it's fun to be that influence yeah you guys like pushing reality's boundaries and like helping other people explore like pushing reality's boundaries too it's kind of like, you know, extroverted intuition, like 
extroverted intuition ne is it pushes metaphysical boundaries with thought but like extroverted sensing it is great at pushing boundaries with reality and what it can do so thank you for just showing us the capabilities of reality and like how to push beyond <laughs> what we currently know to reach new horizons it is my pleasure and uh absolutely my pleasure yeah i love it <laughs> and uh it feels like a like a service to an extent too like when i do that for people i feel like i'm doing a good thing for them because i think that uh i think that entirely too many people live out of fear um and guilt actually i think that those are the two biggest blights on humanity is fear and guilt and if you know <laughs> if i can show people how to live without those things um uh, hell they're better off for it see guys i told you estps were smart <laughs> yeah you you talked about like the ni concept of fear and guilt and like it that's brilliant like estps are so great with life advice like i always considered my brother life smart he's good at like being like life smart just knowing like things like that like the two biggest human follies are like fear or guilt and like helping someone over like overcome that is like a big service and like it feels good to you so thank you for helping people overcome their biggest vices by like teaching them to live a little <laughs> and, and uh on a self-serving side i do offer coaching um, <laughs> i've got a i've got a a snug account uh, that and that is one thing i mean that's really ends up being the normal thing that i've helped most people with is letting go of it's, it's always one of those two things holding them back and those are both very uh sort of suicidal sentiments because i mean it just it, you if you're feeling guilty or fearful you're just you're not living your life you're trying to avoid getting worse and it just it, if you follow that line of reasoning to its limit you might as well just lay down in the grave now because then at least you won't fuck up before you die uh, i mean obviously that's an extreme example but it's still sort of the, the principle yeah and it, it's a really important thing to face your fears and and not die with them because then you're living a half full life and yes, so if you want to face your fears, you can always check out Flow State's coaching service. And I also offer a coaching service as well, and I, a typing service as well, if you guys want to check it out. And so I hope you all have a great one. Um, and I hope you guys have an SE, an SE thrilling experience throughout this week. And I just wish you all the best. So bye, y'all. <laughs>